ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet First Class Kayla Steiner. It's my privilege to welcome you to this 29th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium Fireside Session. Our honored guest speaker for this morning's session is General Jacqueline D. Van Ovos. General Van Ovos is the 14th Commander of the U.S. Transportation Command, one of 11 combatant commands in the Department of Defense. She is a class of 1988 U.S. Air Force Academy graduate and has more than 4,200 hours in more than 30 aircraft. General Van Ovos has held several staff and joint assignments, serving as the Director of Staff for Headquarters Air Force, the Vice Director of the Joint Staff, the Deputy Director for Political and Military Affairs, Strategic Plans and Polit Policy Directorate, Joint Staff, the Director of Mobility Forces for U.S. Central Command, the Vice Commander of the U.S. Air Force's Expeditionary Center, and the Joint Operations Division Chief, Operations and Plans Directorate for U.S. Transcom. Her decorations and awards include the Defense Distinguished Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster, the Defense Superior Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster, the Legion of Merit with Oak Leaf, Clu Leaf Cluster, and the Bronze Star Medal with Oak Leaf Cl Cluster. General Van Ovos, is an honor to talk with you today. <laughs> How are you doing, ma'am? Thanks, Kayla. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. All right, uh, Taya, you know, thanks for, for offering me to come and talk, and thanks for that great inter introduction. You already made me feel old uh, by going through all that. Uh, I refuse to feel that old, but but thanks for honoring me with with that introduction. Look, it's a, it's a great opportunity to talk to you and uh, and and to the entire wing there. Um, first of all, let me just say I, uh, I really would want to have been there physically. I love the academy. I love my experiences there. Uh, and I take every chance I can get back there. Uh, but uh, such is uh, such is the world scene. Uh, when I yes, think about, you know, 34 years ago when I graduated, uh, radar was, uh, Russia was on our radar with respect to where they were going. We were concerned about that. And uh, and never would have thought about two years until about two years ago that we need to really start thinking again about aggressive activities that made a difference out of Russia. And here we are. So I, I think about, you know, we'll always be ready. It's always a, hey, we didn't know that was coming, but the power of being ready uh, really has been demonstrated. So let me talk about, you know, 34 years ago, uh, graduating out of Bulldogs, 13, um, could not imagine uh, that I'd be sitting here today um, talking to you. I tell you, I am jealous of all the adventures uh, that you will be having. I'm living vicariously uh, through you all. Uh, as you finish up your academy experience and head out uh, into the Air Force to lead, right? And uh, while many of you think, um, you know, that your, your path to leader, you know, the four years there, you're going to shape you to become the great leader uh, that you are, your path actually started uh, before you came to the academy, right? The values that were instilled in you uh, as you grew up, and did phenomenal things uh, to even become a part of the academy. And you got off the bus and you, you probably put your boot prints or, or shoe prints into some uh, painted footprints on the, on the ground and you began your academy experience. And your leadership challenge and your development will continue beyond the Air Force Academy. While it sets you all on the right path, there's always a lot to learn. Uh, and so it's really very exciting this institution polishes your skills, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to exercise and evaluate your learning, uh, your learning capabilities, right? Your your ability uh, to act in certain situations, not only at the academy but day one out of the academy, because there are some real, real challenges out there. But know that you are the greatest leaders coming into our military, right? You. Your generation is going to take over. We're going to pass the torch to you, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, and it's a big job, but you are you are going to make such a huge difference. So I'm so excited for you, uh, and I'm really interested in, in um, your questions and and what you want to know about um, uh, the Air Force, the Air Force, bigger force, 
uh, and what I'm doing here at U.S. Transportation Command. Yes, ma'am. And thank you for being here, even virtually, with everything going on. I really appreciate your time. Um, for everybody who's watching, you can ask questions throughout. But for now, we're going to go with a moderated portion. And then at the end, when I'm done asking all of my questions, then we'll go through some of the questions that the audience members have. Um, so to start off, uh, this year's NCLS is kind of focused on ethics and respect for human dignity. That's our, our whole theme and something that we're really hoping that cadets can learn from from our leaders. So um, a lot of my questions are focused on that. Um, so I kind of just want to start off with um, this concept of ethics and respect for human dignity. And how have you seen that embodied either well or not well in the active duty culture? Yeah, look, it's critical. You know, uh, our military is shaped by a set of standards, right? Uh, these core values, uh, they're fundamental uh, to every decision we make, right? It's fundamental to how we groom people. It's fundamental to how we lead. So it's it's really ingrained in our business, um, ethical standards. And oh, I think about, you know, when and when the military goes forward, especially you're into a foreign nation, you are bringing forward our American values, right? So it's not just the core values of the Air Force, but you're representing the greatest military in the world. So what you do, what you demonstrate really makes a difference. And I think about how uh, we exercise you know, ethics-based decision-making all the time in the military decision-making cycle. Right? I see it at the strategic level. Uh, I see them uh, um, rest with uh, questions of, of, is this the right value? Is this, what we is this the intent, right? Is this, if, if you're taking this loan and someone would see, see that you're doing this, what does that mean, right? And I see that at echelon as you lead by example, all the way down to the tactical levels of what we do every day for this nation. So let me give you an example recently because I was involved in Operation Allies Refuge uh, when I was the AMC commander. And um, evacuating our Afghan guests right out of, uh, out of Kabul through uh, various temporary locations into the United States, I think about what our airmen did our airmen and our guardians, what they did to assist those families, right? Like there's no DOTI, there's no AFI that says, okay, when you have Afghan refugees uh, coming by the thousands to your base, this is what you have to do, right? Everyone just sort of pitched in and did what was right. I mean, these uh, these guests, they, they needed medical care, uh, they had children that needed special uh, children needs taken care of, you know, education needs taken care of, um, basic life, health, safety, cultural uh, differences than us uh, when it comes to, you know, our basic needs with the showering and using the restroom and all that. The food needs were different. So what did we see? We saw airmen who had some basic background uh, in uh, Afghani culture come together and they set up these camps. They set up, you know, uh, uh, bathrooms for men and for women. They set up shuras, which are the they allowed the leadership of Afghans to come together as a leadership council and give them advice or give us advice, I would say, uh, to, uh, to how to run the camps and what they needed. And we had women shuras to make sure that the women's voices were heard and that uh, the the children, uh, you know, who they were as they were main caregivers. We knew what the children needed. We could take care of that. Right? All of that was, you know, sort of off the cuff, just using our basic values, right? What do we stand for? And, and I, I say when when the Afghanis, when I was there visiting them in Ramstein and visiting them in McGuire, when they were talking to us, what I saw reflected in them was the American value, right? But when they see in us, they think of America and and so we reflected the very best of America to a people who were scared, you know, or, and uh, who were in need. And that, at the very bottom line, you can't, you can't train that. You, you can't, you know, say, hey, that, the right thing to do is to turn this hangar uh, into uh, an airline passenger terminal in 24 hours, right? Uh, and this comes because of the values that we grew up in. So I, I was just super... Uh, proud of them. They put dignity and respect for every one of those 
um, guests that came through out at the forefront and it showed. Uh, and I was, so I was just so, so proud of them uh, and what they did. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. I think that in, in a pretty dark time that it, it was really cool to see people come through. I was able to go to Holloman um, and see the, the guests there. So that was probably the coolest experience I've had at the Academy so far. Um, but going off of that, obviously, that was a really great example. Do you think there are any areas um, that we need improvement in terms of ethics and respect for human dignity and military culture? Have you seen that uh, play out? Yeah, you know, I'd like to say um, life is perfect, but it's not. Right. I, you have uh, maybe seen um, civilian casualty issues. We've had uh, racial equality issues that we've uncovered uh, in in well in the Air Force and in the other services. So we're we're not done. But I tell you, when we think about the the strategic environment is changing, right? And cultures are changing. And even in the most perfect circumstances, uh, let's say you had a mission, you'd understand. You get commander's intent. And I'm able to relate to you perfect commanders that you absolutely understand everything that has to happen, right? And then you move to an environment, you get a team who you figure are perfectly trained to do exactly what we need to do. And then the environment changes as it does over time, and you're perfectly able to forecast that change and still execute correctly, right? That's a lot of what ifs which is why it's so important we have to be ground in our values because things will change. And in the end, people make the decision and you will be making a decision and it, the guidance won't be, they will, it won't be perfect. The strategic environment will have changed, but what has not changed is your respect for human dignity, dignity, right? The ethical nature of our decision-making has not changed. And when you empower your airmen, they will make that decision. And so we just we all if we go back to what our North Star is every time, for the most part, we'll get it right. But it's it, it's not perfect. And I and I wish that we'd have perfectly predicted outcomes and that we could, you know, make it exactly how we would perfectly be able to do it in a values-based way. But that's just it's just really hard to do. Yeah, I want to expand on that a little more. Obviously, it's a uh, um, some delicate subjects and things to um, enter the Air Force. I mean, my class has got 90 days left and all these people are planning to um, enter the Air Force in this climate. And so what advice would you give to this next generation of leaders um, beyond, beyond the things that you've already touched on um, as yeah. they, they face these issues of inclusivity in their career fields and wherever they end up? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I would say um, lead up. Okay. Um, be an active follower. Uh, and, and lead yourself, lead yourself well, right? Make decisions, follow through on your own, hold yourself accountable to that and be prepared for the opportunities coming your way. We don't know exactly what's going to come our way, right? I was talking about what's going on right now with Russia, Ukraine. We could not have fully predicted that uh, six months ago. So, you know, be ready when the opportunity comes by, right? And when the opportunity comes by, Ask the right questions and be the go-to person to problem solve. And you yourself, be the example. What does that mean, right? Demonstrate how you're inclusive when given a project, right? Make sure that you're bringing, you know, ads to the table. You know, people that have diverse perspectives that will, that will add to the value of what you're trying to do, right? So you've got to be able to demonstrate it at your level. So seek folks with diversity of thought. And, and I tell you, um, how, how do you do that, right? You're, you're a small, you're a flight commander. You, you think you only have the resources in your flight. Well, frankly, you have resources across your squadron, you know, and across the wing, across the base, and your civilian contacts. Think about a network, right? And, and you're a little better positioned than I was because right now with social media and everything, you guys are really connected. So you can reach out in a lot of different ways, more ways than, than I felt like I had uh, when, I, when I graduated. But you also, on the, on the downside of that, you have to be really discerning because misinformation, it's a lot more misinformation and disinformation out there. It was a little easier for us to find what ground truth was, but we're dealing in the gray zone uh, out there in, in activities. And you, you got to dig and discern. So listen for that truth, right? And, and make sure it resonates with your values when you see that, right? When you see something uh, that doesn't look right, ask yourself, who said it? You know, 
What, what have they been writing about lately? Why do you think they said that? What did they omit, right? Uh, what did they omit that would have changed this, right? And, and always, I don't mean to be skeptical, but you really need to learn to discern. Uh, and along those lines, to help me with that, I have an accountability partner, right? Someone who walks with you along the way, probably doesn't look like you, and you don't want them to think like you, someone who can come at it from another way and, and help you in your journey, right? So when, when you lead up and you're, you're part of the team and know, people know they can come to you being the go-to problem solver and how you solve problems and you demonstrate that you solve problems by bringing everyone together and being inclusive, right? That's the, though, that's what's gonna increase trust, right? And inspire trust in others uh, when, you're, when you're out there leading. Yes, ma'am. I love the idea of um, gathering diverse perspectives and talking to people who think differently than you. I think that's exactly what the Leadership Symposium is doing, is giving us the opportunity to talk to people from different backgrounds and different walks of life. So that's something that I really appreciate about my opportunities here. Um, but I kind of want to take it off of us a little bit and talk about your career a little more and um, the organization you're a part of. Um, so with Trans Transcom specifically, um, how is your organization um, uh, taking on initiatives to make sure people feel uh, included in, within your organization. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, so at Transcom, we project and sustain the joint force around the world at a time and place of our of our nation's choosing. Right? We do transportation and distribution. So we have teams. We have people all over the world uh, at different ports, airports, seaports, uh, and and we're we're headquarters here at Scott Air Force Base. But the one thing we all have in common, right, is people. People make this work. Right? And so I think about how one of my priorities, my key priority that, that really surrounds everything else that we do is that we empower a competitive and resilient warfighting team. And so there's a lot of words there, but empowerment means trust, means you're giving orders and, and, and you expect that they're gonna trust those and they're gonna trust each other to carry out. That teamwork piece means that we're all together. We can't do it alone. None of us is as smart as all of us. And all of us means that not only do you, can you come sit in the table, you've gotta be able to participate, right? I talk about be ready for that opportunity. Your voice needs to be heard at the table because if it's not, you know, we're missing an opportunity to make a better decision. So as I go talk to folks about, you know, how do you better empower, right? How do you make people competitive? Competitive, not just professionally, but personally, right? This is, this is iron sharpens iron. This is thinking about different ways uh, to do things. It's how we're going to outsmart and accelerate change so that we can be better uh, and make things better for the organization, for the institution, and for the mission, right? Uh, and, and resiliency, I, I harp on resiliency, making sure that people are doing what they do to recharge themselves, whether that's faith, family, uh, you know, activities outside the workplace, activities in the workplace, making sure that they're ready so that when they come and they make decisions and they're, and they're doing their day to day, they're at, they're at their very best. But we will never be at our very best if everybody doesn't feel like they can participate and, and be included. Because when, and you probably know this, when you're empowered, and, and you feel like what you do matters, you're gonna work really, really hard at it. And that's the kind of culture we have to dig out every day. And it's, it's not perfect, and it's not an initiative that I have. This is, I can't do it. I can talk the words all the time, but it's inside the different uh, work centers. It's at the airports, it's at the seaports, it's at the rail lines. Uh, we have to, we have to act, all the teams have to come together to make this work. So I depend on them to do that. And, and I look to get their feedback, we get it in different ways. And again, the strategic environment is changing. And frankly, you know, how we learn is changing. So we're, we're up to the challenge to continue to, to look at different ways uh, to empower a competitive, resilient team. 
I think that's great to hear about culture of active duty, especially for me um, and entering the Air Force. I think it's exciting to hear that our leaders have these sort of perspectives. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, your leadership style in particular and uh, how have you been able to develop that over the years, obviously coming from the Air Force Academy and from Second Lieutenant at U to General U, uh, how have you developed that leadership style to ensure every voice is heard and, and focus on these things that you're talking about? Yeah, you know, I you know I learned to be as collaborative as I could. You know, started here at the academy, uh, I, and you you get these experiences by challenging yourself, right? Being courageous enough to step up when an opportunity comes, and sometimes you're not courageous enough. Somebody next to you goes, "Hey, you need you should volunteer for that because it's easy to develop and want to develop the areas you're really good at." <laughs> You know, um, taking the initiative and determination. For me, it was a lot of engineering stuff. I mean, I, I love to be a pilot, and so I always wanted to focus on my tactics. It's a little more uncomfortable to develop in areas that you know you're not as good in. So as I say, you have an accountability partner to help push you that way, and, and, and if you have a good mentor, that will also push you that way and say, no, you need to go do that. So <clears throat> staying active along those lines to make yourself a better person first, right? We're talking about yourself, leading yourself, being a better person first, and then I can be a better leader for the Air Force and our airmen and guardian. Right? And and it's constant, right? You're this is not about getting a degree and moving on. This is this is an everyday thing. This is about, you know, reading. Uh, it's about again exceeding in your comfort zone, uh, going to different things that you wouldn't find yourself doing uh, as a captain. You know, going to Toastmasters because I didn't like to give speeches and we had a Toastmasters organization and, you know, started as much as that was uncomfortable doing. You know, even going to the CGO council uh, was uncomfortable for me. I just wanted to hang out uh, with my pilot folks, but I knew that there was so much more than my career field going on and how everything came together as an Air Force. And I know you learned it there at the academy and you learn about what major command is, and you go to units, you go to wings and squadrons, and you understand the enlisted force and the officer force. But when it all comes together and you're out there, you're really kind of focused initially on your tactical area. But the more and more you can go sit with other people and learn what they do, the better appreciation you have to make yourself better in your career and develop yourself as a leader. So it, it's constant, uh, and so it's never one and done. But the good news is you are lifelong learners, right? If you were a lifelong learner, you wouldn't be at the academy because you do so much more compared to a regular university ROTC. Yes, ma'am. I, lo I love the concept of a lifelong learner. And you kind of touched on a, a question I always like to ask leaders myself um, is what, what is the best book that you've ever read and uh, that's had an impact on your career journey as a leader? I, I think that's a, yes. a good one to keep adding to our list. Yeah, you know, first of all, I would say earlier in my career, I was, you know, kind of a John Maxwell standard, you know, leadership, coaching kinds of things. But as I moved more towards uh, squadron command and beyond, it was more of the senior level. So Lincoln on leadership, leadership principles. And uh, frankly, as, as a wing commander, Simon Sinek came out uh, and that's when he was starting to get big. And I tell you, the start with why has been something I talk about a lot. Uh, and it's it's not just because, you know, sort of what, what are you doing? What's what's your why? What's your purpose? What's what's the why of the squadron? Um, but writ large, um, ensuring again that connection between members in the unit, right? It wasn't wasn't just determine your why and put a put a slogan up on the board. It was how do we live that? That's the hard part, right? You can have someone come in and help you facilitate the why, but actually living that why and then learning for me as a more senior person how to take um, the strategic environment and put it in context which helps you with the why so that in the end when you explain to your airmen and guardians what it is you need them to do if you start with the problem or the context or i'll call it the why then they will be, be able to make better decisions because they fully understand what you're really trying to do and what's our North Star here with this project? And so that you don't give them boundaries, you give them possibilities, right? 
with the Y. So that's why I like Simon Sinek. And then when he came out with the Infinite Game, I just went over the top. You know, total fan follower of Sam of Simon Sinek. I, I listen to his blogs and and uh, and watch him because we are in an infinite game. And when we talk about competition with China and Russia, um, this isn't about win or lose today. This is win or lose forever. This is about our children and our grandchildren and how we have to compete every day to get better every day because that's what they're doing. And that's what a real competition is. In chess, when the game is over, you walk away. We don't walk away. It's, it's, it's with every day. So I would say, you know, uh, Simon Sinek, you know, five stars. That's good to hear because we have him speaking this afternoon actually to cadets. So uh, hopefully people will be able to get something out of that. I know I'm excited to hear him. Um, in terms of um, some of the more issues you've faced in your career, um, do you have any examples of significant barriers that you faced in your development or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Kayla, that's, uh, when I think about barriers in development, first of all, I don't, you know, I came into the military when women were not allowed in combat, but I, I don't blame the military for how we started out, how, you know, could I have been a fighter pilot right from the get go? Uh, I didn't have that opportunity because I was a female. So I don't, I don't consider that a barrier that I needed to, to, uh, to overcome myself. Right. And I don't blame anyone for that piece. But what I, I really do uh, think about though, is not the system, but my choices, right? What were my choices, the good and the bad that I made throughout my career and how that affected me. And yes, because of the system, your choices are in some cases limited. But just like saying, hey, when I wanted to, I wanted to fly fighters, I couldn't do it in operations because I couldn't be in combat. So I applied to, to test pilot school so I could fly fighters there. I, I, I made my own way, right? And eventually, women uh, were able to uh, fly in combat. So, so again, following your passions is, is really important and, and not accepting a, someone says a no for you. Uh, only you can say no to yourself. What are, you know, what are my other opportunities? Be really open to what my other opportunities are. On the, on the side of how perhaps my choices hindered my development, uh, for example, I did not want to go to a squadron officer school. You know, uh, sort of, I was, uh, you know, somewhat, you know, large and in charge after I left the academy. And I thought, well, you know, I, I shouldn't have to go to SOS. Um, I want to get operationally waived. There, at that time, there, there was a waiver that you didn't have to go to squadron officer school. And I, I emphatically told my commander that I did not need to go to that school. And I was way too valuable as a test pilot. And uh, I couldn't do that. And uh, so that, that got me a couple of appointments up the, up the chain a little bit. And then I was told to go to school reluctantly. I did really well. And I think that helped me uh, understand the rest of the Air Force because you, you hang out with the rest of the Air Force during SOS. And, um, and so I, you know, I learned that, hey, I know I did. I went reluctantly. I learned a lot. I also went reluctantly to the Pentagon after Air Command and Staff College. I didn't want to go there. I thought, again, my talents were somewhat wasted. I should go back. Uh, and, uh, and be a test pilot. There was a lot going on there. Uh, and of course, I was not given the choice. And I wasn't, you know, uberly happy when I showed up uh, to the Pentagon. But then I learned so much at the Pentagon. And it set me up for being a commander. And you never would have thought that because I'm like, oh, staff job. Why, that's, why is that important? Again, I didn't know what was good for me. And so you have folks that are over you, either they're, mentor, they're mentors that, uh, or uh, accountability partners that say, you know, you really ought to rethink that. And so, um, you know, try not to let your, your personal decisions uh, do harm, but I tell you, you know, that's why having a mentor and a network is helpful. Listen to others that have been there. Uh, there's really not much new under the sun. You may have slightly different circumstances, but when you talk to folks who have done it, you know, you recognize that, hey, this can be done. And actually, this might be a better way to do it. So I would say I had my own unconscious biases about what I should be doing in the Air Force. And I learned there was a whole other world out there that I never would have known had I had it my way. So. Thank you for that. I think your story is really great to hear for people who, who are women or other um, people coming in the Air Force. And your, your story really paved the way for us to 
to be able to do what we're, we're hoping to do. Um, so you kind of touched on these uh, barriers that were outside of your control. Um, so looking at the changes that have happened in the Air Force over the past few years and things that are happening now, uh, do you feel the military is making enough changes to promote ethics and respect for human dignity, or are there areas where we need to be making more changes in the future? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, so it's it's yes and no, right? Uh, I'm sure that's the answer you expected. Uh, yes, because we're not perfect, right? And and remember, these are uh, this is not a program. Uh, none of these are programs. This is ethics in action, right? And humans will make mistakes. So how do you make, as uh, Jill Goldfein would tell me, how do you make the right things easy to do and the wrong things hard to do? I think we have some work continue to do there, right? And you have seen it with the racial disparity report that, you know, we're, we're not we're not listening. Uh, we need to be more empathetic. We have to understand how all these things come together such that, you know, it causes a person that was on the right track to, to go off the track, right? How do we make the wrong things hard to do? And, and that is more by example, and, but in some cases it's systemic in the institution, as you probably talk, talked about, uh, with extremism again, and, and, and racial disparity. And we have to get rid of that. In some cases, it's just microaggressions that we see that, are, that could be unconscious, right? Uh, people who grew up that way just didn't know it, just didn't know that that was the wrong thing to say at the wrong time. Uh, and, and in some cases, it's not. It, it is not unconscious. Sometimes it's conscious and we got to take care of that, right? But it's through our demonstrating that, that we are taking action is where you need to hold us to account. We all need to be holding each other to account to that, but we also need to hold the institution to account uh, for those kinds of violations. And again, the strategic environment is changing. And as it changes, we have to incorporate that you know, into our ethical decision-making model. You know, we will never have perfect circumstances to make the perfect decision. All we can do is make the best decision knowing what we have and given the guidelines and everything that we've grown up with and, and have proven over the years. And again, you know, you know, ethically, you know, we think, we think about a tactical decision these days. A tactical decision can have strategic effects that's why when we're doing new stuff every day, I think about, I was talking to our cyber protection team yesterday. I think about the whole cyber realm that we're getting into and, you know, hunting forward and, uh, you know, potentially you, you have the power to turn the lights off. You have the you have power to do destructive work. I mean, is that the right ethical thing to do? It may be to take the military power out, but if the hospital power goes out as well, you know, and, and, and you knew that that could happen, did you bring that up to your superiors who may not understand uh, the, the links between the hospital power system and the military headquarters power system? Right. And, and so we have to bring it up that at the tactical level, go, hey, you know, so we could do this, but, but here are some potential things that could happen on the side, and we have to bring all of that up and have to bring it forward. In the end, we may have to make a military decision, but do we have everything? We may train people to understand all of those consequences. And, and, and there's a lot, there's a lot there to do. And that's why I say in some cases, I had a lot easier than you have it because we didn't have that gray zone as much, right? We had some, uh, but not near as much as what you're gonna have to navigate in the future. I think it's interesting to hear kind of that bigger picture perspective. So, um keeping in mind all of the innovation that's happening, how do we continue to encourage innovation and diversity of thought and um, get, getting those different perspectives throughout the force um, and all the way down to people who are at a much uh, uh, lo smaller picture level? How do you encourage that sort of thinking? Yeah, so first, you know, encouraging um, innovation and inclusion uh, ought to be a matter of really uh, a war fighting imperative. We, we, uh, when the chief staff of the Air Force talks about it, accelerate change or lose, we've already recognized that we must change. Like the risk of not changing is greater than the risk of changing. And once you've determined you have a burning platform where you say the risk of not changing, the risk of the status quo is far greater than the risk of changing. That's, that begins the imperative. That's where you incentivize folks to say, hey, I need you to come back with a different way of doing things. 
because we, we uh, think about my mission here at Transportation Command. Now we have to move stuff faster and further to more locations if we have to have a conflict out in the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is vast. And so we have a lot more to do. So can we do our job at scale? And the answer is not favorable. So we have got to think now about how are we going to be take more stuff to more places while, while being under contested, while under GPS jamming, while being cyber attacked, and maybe you can't, you've lost your communications where you don't have SATCOM, right? Or you perchance gone, gone into an, uh, an area where you, you could, could be part of a kinetic target, right? We have to think about all those things. So we have to think about it now, or we're sitting at 1G uh, before uh, it, things start flying. And so you have to incentivize it here inside the structure, meaning as a senior leader, I have to understand that we're going to take we're going to take disciplined risk in our decision making, in our initiatives. Uh, notice we'll take risk, we say disciplined risk, at least we, we have to come up with how do you characterize that risk. And then I have to incentivize both the achievements and the failures. Because if you've taken a disciplined risk and you fail, we have learned something. We have learned that that way is not exactly going to work in the circumstances today. It may work in the circumstances tomorrow, by the way, but not today. So right now we have to change that in some way. What are the parameters we have to change? I have to be just as comfortable doing that. And let me tell you, and how I grew up, that's hard to do, right? Um, and with, with, in some cases, there was you know, no tolerance. And now what I'm saying is I have to be the one that is out there physically telling people, go take that risk. And, and it has to be at echelon because if I'm not willing to take the risk, you know, my my general officer leaders, they won't they won't want to take the risk. And then their colonel leaders won't want to take the risk. And it just gets worse all the way down. So I have to squint to see the innovation. And then I got to get there and talk to those airmen or guardians and say, thank you for what you're doing. This is important. This is why it's important. And how can I help you? Right. And when I do that, you better believe that the leaders below me will do that as well. And I, I am a firmly of belief that the way we can think of things differently is by having different perspectives. If everybody's thinking the same way, and that's because of your career field, you all grew up that way, you're all in nuclear operations, or all in airlift, or all fighter. If, if you stay in that bin, you're not going about thinking about things differently. So you've got to have people on your team that are willing to challenge you. The only way to do that is to build that trust, those inclusive empowered teams. I think being comfortable with change and the, the possibility of failure is something that we all could probably be better at. Um, but I'll, I'll leave you with one last question before we switch over to things that the audience um, has sent in. Um, just to end it off, uh, what, what is the best advice you've ever received in your career? Yeah, um, so uh, first of all, I've received a lot of advice in my career. Um, I, uh, I would start with a quote really from Roosevelt um, which is people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And if you think about that, they, you have to make a connection because people make all the decisions, right or wrong, right? They make the mission happen. You buy all this cool stuff, but it, without people, it's not going to work. And the, the people will respond to you if they know that you care about them and their families and their development personally professionally, their resiliency, and when you care, they will go over the moon for the mission and for what you're asking them to do, right? And so knowing that you invest in them and knowing that they matter to you is the best piece of advice. That works in all situations, whether, whether you're at church, you know, whether you're at the grocery store or whether you're in the flight room, it matters that, that people know that you care about them uh, because that is how you get the mission done. Thank you so much for that and for your time today. Uh, we'll now transition to our question and answer period. Our audience might type uh, questions into the discussion board and align with this virtual session on the NCLS event platform. And then I will then relay those questions over to you, ma'am. Um, so the first one is uh, somebody who's curious about your uh, experience at Test Pilot School, and they want to know, uh, how did your education experience at Test Pilot School shape your approach to leadership? 
Uh, first of all, TPS was awesome. I took, I was aeronautical engineer there. I took the, uh, the, there was, and I think there still is, uh, a, I'll call it a test pilot school short course. I took it my senior year there. Uh, and I was absolutely in love with it. I went over to test pilot school as part of that curriculum and flew there as a senior. And I just, just loved it. I actually did an internship with them also in, in one of my summers. So I was head over heels, uh, test pilot, right? And uh, so how did that shape me? First of all, I, I got an advanced degree in mechanical engineering. I, I focused on the skills that made me a really good pilot because I knew that that was required to go to test pilot school uh, besides the engineering piece. Uh, and it really helped uh, stretch uh, me because it was a really challenging course. It's not just about flying, it's about thinking, it's about developing and designing into the future and being a part of future acquisition for our Air Force. So. I would say, you know, first and foremost, I did a lot of technical work. I did um, a lot of growth in that area, and and I really enjoyed. It. And also some work with industry, which which was really really very enjoyable. But as I became a more senior person uh, there uh, as test, and then I went back to the school and taught test pilot school, I started to recognize that not only do I need to work on the the you know the technical and operational, I need to be more of a strategic leader. Uh, as I watch people make decisions about programs, which take forever to field, uh, that you're making a decision about a program that you're going to field in 10 years. And, and the decision-making process itself was, you know, was, was really, it was kind of hard because you had to really think about what it would actually look like when you, when you asked for it. And, and, you know, be careful what you ask for kind of things way back here, because then you're going to get what you asked for 10 years later. So how do, how do I think about the future? You've got to be thinking about war fighting in the future. So that was really be, began my sort of my journey of looking, you know, beyond my next assignment into how the Air Force was developing and how I was helping the Air Force into the future, uh, not just about the certain mission set that I had, but writ large for where we were going. So I, I really helped me begin to think. And then I went to Air Command and Staff College afterwards and began sort of it really complemented the school because I was able to think more about the future and strategy and how my work and requirements in developing systems fit into the strategy of the Air Force. Thank you for that. Um, but keeping, I loved it. Definitely do it if you can. I'm definitely looking to fly planes, so I guess we'll see um, where, what happens in the next couple of years. Um, but keeping, keeping on the um, pilot topic, um, this question is, uh, what would you do to address the pilot shortage and specifically the discrepancy of female pilots in commercial aviation? Yeah, uh, so first of all, um, you know, when we say, what, what would you do to address the, the shortage of pilots? Now, what would your advice be? Let me just look at me, right? I'm a senior leader in the Air Force. I've been part of uh, this, you know, the pilot crisis task forces. I've been part of, hey, how do we get more females and minorities represented in as pilots in the Air Force? So, you know, all errors, uh, you know, I look at myself and go, how could I have done better? How, how, how what better advice could I have given with respect to increasing the number, the number of females? Now, I look at the Air Force Academy. We have a lot more leeway. Uh, there, I look at how you all, first of all, class, uh, class representation matters, right? If you get more females, more minorities, more chances that they'll go into the operational career fields and more chances they're going to go in, in and become a pilot. Um, and, and you can't make a pilot tomorrow, right? You have to think, you have to, you know, you have to fish in, in, at 10th grade uh, and really earlier than 10th grade. You have to start fishing and inspiring so I've done a lot of work in STEM, and, I, and, and we really, with recruiting, we're working on Inspire programs where we get folks to, to, to work in STEM and to get into the schools, specifically to talk about females and minorities about careers in the Air Force. And for me, I was sort of the lead advocate for the pilot uh, piece. So, I, uh, so working with recruiting, uh, getting pilots out there, uh, and getting young female pilots to come with, and and talk to those uh, you know sometimes you, you, know, you can't it, you can't be it if you can't see it and so can you see yourself doing this i think is a big thing for minorities uh, and for women and that's not just uh, pilots that's with stem writ large or for our nation and the same thing uh, you know with women in, in civilian aviation you, you may know that I, I did a lot in civilian aviation before i went to the air force academy i was a flight instructor and uh and there weren't many females there and and i'm 
part of the 99s, which is an international women's organization, as well as women in aviation, trying to get out to air shows and ex explain to young ladies that you can become a pilot uh, for the commercial as well. So it will never be done uh, because we just have to keep incentivizing. So how do we recruit? How do we retain? Right? We don't have a pilot slot problem. We have a retention problem. Right? We can get people into pilot slots, but we can't keep them. So how do you make uh, a career uh, self-fulfilling? How do we make it so that women and minorities can thrive in operational careers like being a pilot or being a NAV or air battle manager, right? And, and that's up to us. That's up to me and senior leaders in the Air Force to ensure that the culture is there. That's the racial disparity report. How do we, how do we work on that? How do we give opportunities? How, do we, how, how are pilot slots given, right? How can we write the whole height, you know, that really discriminates against minorities and women because we're not normally, uh, you know, our, our median height is a lot less than the minimum height average. So how do we how do we make that better and so that we can thrive so that I can turn around behind me and say, yeah, indeed, there's more than six percent women pilots out there. We're going to bring a lot more in because we have a lot. We have a lot to offer and, and we're not fishing in all the talent pools out there and we need to. And so I, I know that the recruiting is doing a great job. Uh, Joel and Thomas out there. Uh, we're trying to get everybody out there, uh, all hands on deck to go visit colleges, go visit high schools. And, and tell them about what we do. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the next one is, um, can you talk briefly about the work you did on the Department of the Air Force's Barrier Analysis Working Group? Sure, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when I first became the director of the, joint, of, the, of the Air Staff, and I had a couple of women come in and talk to me about uh, the problems that they saw, I thought to myself, wow, uh, you know, I, yes, I lived through some of those problems. Some of those problems I didn't realize were still there, right? I'd come out of the joint world after a while, came back to the Air Force and went, the things that I talked about when I was a squadron commander and wing commander are still there. What is going on? And I think that, you know, Joe Brown would echo that, you know, what, what is going on that we still have issues? And when they, they started out with, uh, we had a missileer, they said, you know, when you're pregnant, you can't, you can't do your missileer duties. And I, and I said, well, you know, what is that about? Oh, because you're DNIF, duty not including flying. And, and, they, and our missileers fall, fell under the same category. So when you're pregnant, you're DNIF. And so they could not do their job. And they weren't even flying in an airplane. And I thought, and, and why is that? Well, because, you know, in 1947, that's the same right. It's a, you know, it's the same, you know, we didn't make any changes. So I said, all right, now we need a, another set of eyes to go through all the regs. And as tedious as that is, uh, then we said, okay, what we need to do is get out and, and do it through social media, right? And so we already had Jay Rutt and team already had a couple of social media blogs and started pulling it all together. And we just started asking people, you know, what are the issues? And that's what I really, that's what I found really empowering because we could get, we could coalesce on an issue very quickly. You didn't have to be stationed in the Pentagon to make a difference. So when that was empowering, because I felt like we were then going after those things, we were making it very obvious, like, you know, with the hair standards, right? Free the bun. And did I fully understand the issues with hair standards with African-American women and what that meant for them later in life with the medical issues that they had? Yeah, no, I didn't understand that. Right. So uh, we need to shed light on the, what the issue is. And there, there are new issues that pop up all the time because things change and you don't, you don't even think about it. Right. How did I, how did I have hair issues? Well, you know, I had long hair, um, after the Academy at the Academy, I had to grow, you know, you had to grow, had the hair cut short when I was there, but I grew my hair long and then I went to test pilot school and I, and I used to have to French braid my hair. And when they poured my helmet, uh, if you didn't have the French braid exactly correct, it would give you hot spots. And I would come out with burning hot spots and migraines uh, at test pilot school. And so I ended up just chopping my hair off because I, you know, because you, know, you couldn't wear the ponytail that, that came out of the helmet, which we can do now. And, and I found it, you know, a nuisance, but I put up with it. You don't have to put up with it. <laughs> but that's, you know, sort of how we did it. So bring it to someone's attention, right? 
have the courage to do that. And then help us work through that. What, what are the, and that's, that's the different, differing perspectives. And so I found it really liberating. And we didn't get it all right. We're still working on ejection seats right now and pregnancy. We still have you know, a few things there to do, but, but it's on the list. And, and you'll hear from Chief Bass as well. It's on the list. And, and just help us fill that list out, right? And help us prioritize that list. Uh, and it's all within our power. It's all within our power to do. I asked though that what, what, what effect does it have on the institution? What effect does it have on the mission, right? And part of that is readiness and resilience. And if we lose women uh, because, because you know, they can't keep up with their careers, because they have to be taken out, because they have two children and all that, then it, it goes against our readiness. And why would we want to you know, voluntarily take a readiness hit because of this? And when you couch it in terms of that, you know, that, that, that was the magic of it. We could, we could show how it affected readiness, how it affected promotions and all that. Uh, and that was, that was the money part because data rules. And we have a lot of people that can take data. We can work with Rand and get data taken. We just need to know where to focus our efforts. Yeah, I think that in the hair cha standards changing was definitely a big one for us this past year. <laughs> um, kind of going off of um, um, mission readiness, um, as U U.S. military members, what is our role in ensuring our people and organizations are ethical while still accomplishing the mission to the best of our ability? Yeah, yeah well, you can't separate them. Uh, because our mission, like I said, our mission requires American values. And the core values that your values that you came when you, when you came to the academy, the home to the core values that we are laying out for our military are critical in our ability to make decisions every day about our jobs. Because, you know, unlike some other regimes, we don't, we don't make you work inside a box, right? We expect you, we, we're, we're going to empower you, which means you're going to work outside this box, which means that all the decisions will not have been made. They will not have been made. And when you make a decision out of this box, you need to ensure that it comports with the core values of our military and the American values, right? When you, that's why we say it's, you know, when you uh, go TDY somewhere overseas and someone sees you in a uniform and you do something, you know, that's not ethical, they don't think of you as a person. They think of you as the United States. They think of you as the U.S. military, right? They're watching all the time. So, you know, you cannot divorce yourselves from ethical standards and actually do the mission. So, so how, do you, um, how do you keep it at the forefront may be a better question. And yes, we have annual ethical guidelines as part of our training. We have to go over what the ethical guidelines are and sort of, you know, get refreshed with some of the ethical dilemmas that we face day to day. And the cool thing about that, that training is that we'll take current ethical things that are going on right now and put it into a scenario and talk to people about it, right? Because it and, and it fits whether you're an airman uh, that's that's working in in the in the uh, in the personnel flight or you're an airman, you know, flying an airplane. Uh, because again, the mission when it all comes together requires all of our parts. So when we go through and we think about the ethical decisions that we have to make every day to ensure that the mission gets done. Let's say my readiness, right? We used to call, you know, flippantly something called pencil whipping back when we had to use paper for stuff. In our, if you had to, you know, to be ready, you had to do so many things, right? Uh, so many tactical maneuvers. Uh, you had to do some reading, right? On, uh, and so you had to do these things. And if you, and you had to mark it off that you did it, right? You signed off that you did those things and you turned it into your supervisor, you thumped it into a machine. Uh, and, and for people who didn't want to, do, to actually do it, and they didn't have someone on, over their shoulder making sure that they did it, we, they did something called pencil whip, right? They just penciled it and said that they didn't, but they didn't actually do it, right? That's a violation of ethics. The whole reason we have to do those things is so that, that we're ready. And so when you pencil whip something, we know you're not ready. Now, Put aside the fact that we, you know, we relooked all the act, all of our additional duties and all of our training and make sure it's valuable. We always have to do that. We always have to continue to go, well, is it, was it really valuable? And if it's not valuable, we should get rid of it. 
you shouldn't pencil whip it. Don't pencil whip it because it's not valuable to you. We should take the, the, the time it takes to change the regulation, to bring it up to your supervisor, that this is no longer really applicable. That's the right thing to do for the institution. Fix the institution. Don't just make it easy on a, on a particular person. Thank you, ma'am. Um, we have time for like two more questions. So, um, but this one is, um, what lessons did you learn as a cadet at the Air Force Academy about inclusivity and respect for human dignity that have stuck with you throughout your career? You know, there. Um, first of all, you know, at your Air Force Academy, we have a lot of a lot of opportunities for leadership. I would say a little more than uh, ROTC graduates, right? You have your critical programs, and you start out with followership, then you do peer-to-peer -peer leadership, uh, and then as you get different assignments as leaders uh, within the academy, you have an opportunity to do spirit subordinate leadership, right? And so because you have, and then we do it in sports, right? We do it in clubs. And because you have so many different facets of leadership that you can exercise the academy, you're, you're in a really good position to exercise those morals and those ethics, you know, every day, right? And you know, I think you'll learn something a little different as a follower than as peer-to-peer -peer than as severe subordinate. I think peer-to-peer -peer is, the, is the hardest kind, right? You're in your own class, right? You're a bunch of flight commanders, or even you're an ops officer and a flight commander. And it, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, one day uh, you're the superior and one day you're the subordinate. And I think what I, what I best learned at the academy was that you, you value every person for what they bring at the table, right? Leadership can be a title or it can be an action, right? Just because you're the squadron, cadet squadron commander doesn't mean you run everything. And it's really how you treat everybody else. So don't treat, you know, leadership as a title. My title, transcom commander, combatant commander, is going to bring with it, you know, respect, you know, leadership. People are going to have to follow my orders. I would rather that they follow my orders because it's the right thing to do for this mission to accelerate change to ensure that we can project and sustain the joint force that is having place of our choosing, right? And as an informal leader at the academy, you see it all the time, right? Who, who are the informal leaders that get stuff done, right? And they don't care if they're, if they're the flight commander or not. If a flight has a, a mission to do, they will roll up their sleeves and do it. So to me, it doesn't matter where you are, you can make a difference. And I think that you see it in the different roles that you have. But you can't make a difference if you're not at the table and you're not ready and you don't have the courage to put your hand out and say, you know, let me noodle with that. Let me let me take that on. Let me let me consider that and bring it back to the team. Right. As it's, it's easy to sit at the table. It's a little harder to participate. And that's where you're that's really where you where you learn is when you're a little shy about going, well, I don't really know if I have the time to do this, but I really think I need to develop in this area. I'm going to have a courage to say, yes, I'm going to take this on. And, and frankly, when you become a lieutenant and you're faced with all these different initiatives while they're going on, you're going to recognize you can't do it alone. You need those informal leaders. You may be the flight commander, but you need those informal leaders to step up. You're going to identify them pretty quick. And you can use your network that you're working on to pull together diverse teams to get after it. And you're going to empower those teams as those are the high powering teams, right? Stanley McChrystal's team of teams, man, those empowered teams, they will move mountains for you. And that, that is money. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I think that is all the time that we have today. We had some good questions. So, um, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to us and giving us your perspectives. I think it's really helped our own view of ethics and respect for human dignity for, for myself and for everybody watching. Um, on behalf of our 2022 NCLS participants, the Cadet Wing and the faculty of the Air Force Academy, uh, we'd like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. We'll be mailing this to you so that you can um, have that as a reminder of your time with us. Um, so we really appreciate that. 
Um, for everyone else, this, this concludes our session. Uh, we would appreciate audience feedback at the close of your MCLS experience. You may access the survey um, at the uh, iPad stations in the Arnold Hall foyer and the Polaris Hall um, or on the event app. Finally, we encourage you to stop by our testimonial booth on the south side of the Arnold Hall foyer uh, where you can record an audio or video review of the session and your overall thoughts on NCLS 2022. Thank you all and have a great day. Nice. Great job, Kayla. Thank you so much, ma'am.